It's the third day. Today is the third day since these things were done. Yay! And certain women, also of our company, made us astonished by what, <laughs> which were early at the sepulcher. And they found not his body, and they came saying, they had also seen a vision of a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, found it even so as the woman had said. But they, but him, they saw not. <laughs> In English, that means they didn't see him. <laughs> then he said unto them, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe. Slow of heart to believe. Notice how he didn't say slow of mind to believe. Because a man believes in his heart. Slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded... Ooh, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither he went, and he made though, as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. They constrained him. That's like you're grabbing pant, the pant leg of Jesus and you're not letting go, saying, you're taking me with you. You're taking me with you. I'm not letting you go unless you have enough strength to throw my arms off of you. <laughs> the creator, you know. <laughs> That's like taking your heart, just wrapping it around Jesus and hanging on with everything inside you. It's like taking all the focus off of the world, all the focus off the problems, all the focus off of the things that drag you away from Him and saying, I'm constraining you. You have to abide with me. Abide with me, Jesus. I want to abide with you and you and me. I want to be with you. You're worth more to me than all the distractions. You're worth more to me than all, any, anything of value. Nothing of value comes close to even just being with you, even just staring at you. I just want to sit at your feet like Mary and just let your words wash over me because I know that life comes within your words. You're everything to me, Jesus. He made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening the day is far spent. And he went to tarry with them. He saw the hunger in their hearts. You know, the presence of God will always flood a hungry heart. Because that's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And he is our righteousness. Not our own filthy rags. You're hungering and thirsting after Him. Say, well, I already have Him. Well, I want more. Wait, wait till my heart is burning, then I'll know how much I have of Him. And if my heart is still human, if it's still, it's still beating flesh, then I still need more. I want, I want Him so much that it's just nothing of me. It's just me consumed in this river of living water. It's me consumed by the life spirit of God. Nothing of me, just all of you, Holy Ghost. <sighs> Day is far spent, and he went to tarry with them. He went to chill out with them, because he saw their hunger. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them. As they have done many times before. He broke the bread and fed the multitudes. He said, gather up the baskets so nothing will be lost. He broke the bread many times. At the last supper they had communion together. And he broke the bread. And then he did it again. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. He is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. <laughs> Jesus revealed the scriptures. Jesus revealed the scriptures to the disciples. He opened their understanding. And then he opened their eyes by the breaking of the bread. That brokenness. Fall on the rock and be broken. Why? 
so that the fragrance of Christ can be released into the atmosphere. He opened their eyes and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. What happened there? Through the brokenness of the bread, they knew him. They recognized him. They seen him. And then he vanished out of their sight. He vanished out of their, their natural sight. Because he wants them to he wants them to follow him where he is. That where he is they may be also. Where is he? Heavenly places. He disappeared from the natural realm so that they would chase him in the spirit. They'll chase him in the heart. Do not our hearts burn when he went over the scriptures with us? When he remembered the things that passed, our hearts were ignited. And as we walk with him now in the presence, our, in the present, our hearts were burning. As he broke the bread, our vision opened wider. And into the future, he's leading, he left a trail of his presence for us to follow. Because when you remember the past, it activates a burning and an anointing. It's there that you, and then you start, your eyes start opening up to things around you. And there's a, there's a pathway to go deeper into the future with him. You follow him. That where he is, you may be also. That when you, you can sit with him on his throne, even as he also has sat down with his father in his throne, and you can see from the kingdom, you can see from God's perspective, you can see and experience the way life is. I say this through experience. You can experience the Father, because that's where Christ has sat down. You can experience heaven. You can experience the unconditional love. And then when you come back to this realm, you can release the kingdom. You can release unconditional love. You can release the anointing that breaks the yoke because you've been with the anointing. You've been with the Father. You have His perspective. You have His heart. And His heart is burning for the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave Jesus to suffer tremendously naturally and spiritually so that we could be healed, saved and delivered, sozo in our bodies, in our soul and our spirit with God true story and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight search your heart like test yourselves whether you are in the faith. Do you not know that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Everything that Christ was, when you read about Him in the Bible, that stuff should be happening around you. That stuff should be happening through you. Does your heart burn when you read the Scriptures, or do you get angry? <laughs> Let's keep reading. And they said, one to another, do not our hearts burn within us? Well, he talked with us, by the way. Well, he opened to us the scriptures. See, now they're remembering just like a few minutes ago. It was like, wasn't it glorious? Did our hearts burn? Jeremiah said, the word of God is like, the, it's like fire in my bones. The first time I ever experienced prophecy come through one of my friends, who was like, he was like a total Pharisee. <laughs> Not total. Like he was, he would, he grew up in church, so he'd be like a Pharisee one day, and then fire of God and Pharisee, fire. He just had to get all that stuff washed out of him. I don't know how he's doing now, but I haven't seen him in years. But I remember, he was just like he was crying out to God. He was hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and God did fill him. And we were up in his pastor's home, and all of a sudden, like we were just in prayer, and I could feel this. Just came in the room. It felt like peace, but the peace was heat. It felt like you were able to walk through the sun, you know, the one that big ball of fire in the sky, and not get burned. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> fire. I'm like, what is this? I didn't say anything. I was like, and then, and then, like about maybe three or five seconds later, I feel like God is saying this. I feel like I'm supposed to prophesy. And he starts prophesying. 
Dude, oh, that's what that was. It was the spirit of prophecy. And it was like fire. And he, I don't even know what he prophesied. He just <laughs> prophesied something. And uh, and then you could for, feel it lift off. And he was still prophesying. Like, oh, man. Later on, I understood that, like, you should only say what God is saying. And then uh, just kind of like, you don't have to add to it. Like, just saying what he's saying is enough. <laughs> but it's human nature. We need to put that thing to death, you know. So it's just Christ's nature coming through us. We're all learning. We're all going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. So there's grace. Grace is the power of God to kill that thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shama. Holy Spirit. Okay. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while well, he talked with us, by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, how do you know that Jesus is talking to you? Because you'll feel a consuming fire of unconditional love purging you. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. <laughs> how do you know a religious spirit's talking to you? Because you'll be so bored, you'll be so lame, you'd rather be playing video games or watching football. I don't even like football. I'd rather be watching football right now. I don't even like football. But uh, it's a religious spirit. They're boring. Religion is really boring. It's like double death. They teach you to die to yourself, but they never give you any resurrection life. It's double death. You're dead on the earth while you walk, and then you're dead in your spirit doing religious things. It's double death. And then you die, and you don't have eternal life. You've never received him. You've re Jesus called them sons of the devil, Pharisees, religious people. You need to receive the Spirit. It's with the heart you believe. And there's evidence in your life because you have a changed heart. You have a changed lifestyle. You live for Him. I mean, a lot of people say they're, you know, Paul, Saul was absolutely religious. He was, he was zealous. He would kill, murder Christians. But he didn't have a changed life because he didn't have a changed heart. And out of the heart flows the issues of life there'll be evidence in your life someone prophesied over me years ago when I brand new believer it's like your family members won't even recognize you I'm going to do such a work in you and it was true because I invited my nephew over and uh, he literally did not recognize me because I looked so, I looked so different I spoke different I believed different I experienced different I'd be like I I brought him to church and we'd be like we'd just be he doesn't even believe in God and uh, like feel the glory man we, we, we have our hands up just rocking to uh, swaying to the, mu the worship music whatever and uh, I was he said a sinner's prayer I don't know if he <laughs> if he meant it from the heart or not but uh, who knows flood him with grace God in Jesus name and truth but uh, a lot of people didn't recognize it. And I went to talk to some old friends from years ago. It's like, who are you? Where did you get all this wisdom? It's like, that Chris is dead. If there's any wisdom, it's not mine because I'm an idiot. <laughs> if there's any wisdom whatsoever coming through me, it is not me at all. It's just because God loves you and he wants you to know he's real. I'm dead. Let's read this. <clears throat> and they said one to another, General Harvest Burma, okay. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told these things which were done in the way, and how was known of them break uh, of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Joseph Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Listen, when Jesus said something like that, when he says, Peace be unto you, it's not just in word only. His words were spirit and life. There was a principality of peace, a wave, tidal wave of peace that's going right through them. How do you know that, Chris? Because I know it through experience. Every time Jesus has ever spoken to me, there's always been tidal waves of peace. So is the Spirit speaking and bringing life to me. 
energizing me, equipping me, just my inner heart just burning, the life of God just consuming me. It feels good. You know, John, like, turns around to see Jesus like a dead man at his feet in the first book of Revelation. You think you know him. You have no idea. I remember standing before just an angel. My flesh, my whole body was just shaking. And I could see that God's face is turned towards us. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do when God's face is facing towards you? You fall on the ground. You just, you worship. You worship the king. You just, there's nothing, and it's just an angel. Like, just the purity that comes into the atmosphere. It's like, I'm just, I'm just like one wrong thought and I could be destroyed. Don't think about anything lustful. Don't think about anything prideful. Don't think. Don't think about anything. Just God, please don't kill me. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Because there's so much power, and it's beyond you. It's beyond you. Moses said, "I exceedingly fear and quake," it's because of the presence of God in the mountain. You think you know God. When you know God, He will leave a mark on you. When Jacob wrestled the angel of the Lord, he was limping. He had a limp. When you have an encounter with God, you'll, your life will be changed. You will not be the same. You cannot be. When you have an encounter with religion, you can remain the same. Your, your vocabulary will change, but it will have no substance in it. The only substance you will probably have is debates and arguments and darkness. But when Christ comes, He changes your heart. It is with the heart that men believe unto salvation and proclaim with their mouth. That's what happened to the disciples. They needed that encounter with Jesus. Because He's the tree of life. They need that spirit of the fear of the Lord. They need that fire of God in their bones. He is the Word of God. They experienced what Jeremiah experienced. But they experienced it face to face. Not, 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 not very... It was like less of a veil. Because the more we go from glory to glory, the thinner that veil becomes. Let's keep reading this. And thus they spake Jesus himself and stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. <laughs> and, they said, and he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Thoughts in your hearts? I thought we think with our mind. <laughs> Behold my hands and my feet, it is, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. I think the Bible says flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He had flesh and bones. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when he had uh, thus spoken, he showed his, unto them his hands and his feet. And while they were, well, they yet believed not for joy. See, they believed not for joy. Faith will always bring you into joy. <laughs> Unbelief will always manifest sadness. You could tell the faces though. Well, you need to be like me. You need to repent and be sad. You need to read the Bible 55 hours a day, but don't pray in the Spirit. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just kidding, man. I'll stop tormenting the religious demons. <laughs> I'll let Jesus do it through me. Hallelujah. Anyways, there's there's a whole lot more. We could. This is an eternal gospel. It goes on forever. But my camera ran out of time. Oh man. The only reason I make these videos is to make you hungry for Him. He's broken the bread. Now follow, follow the bread of His presence. Follow Him and be where He is and open your eyes, which is right here. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Him. Glory. Enjoy your walk with God. Believe and you will have great joy. Revelation chapter 1. 
This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to share with his loving servants, which must occur swiftly. He clearly made it known by sending his angel to his loving servant John. I, John, bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. A joyous blessing rests upon the one who reads this message and upon those who hear and embrace the words of this prophecy. For the appointed time is in your hands. From John to the seven churches in Turkey, may the kindness of God's grace and peace overflow to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are in front of his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruling king who rules over the kings of the earth. Now, to the one who constantly loves us and has loosed us from our sins by his own blood, and to the one who has made us to rule as kingly priesthood, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion throughout the eternity of eternities. Amen. Behold, he appears within the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the people groups of the earth will weep with sorrow because of him. And so it is to be. Amen. I am the Aleph and the Tav, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, am your brother and companion in tribulation, the kingdom, and the patience that are found in Jesus. I was exiled on the island of Patmos because of the ministry of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit realm on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice sounding like a trumpet, saying to me, Write in a book which you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. When I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands. And walking among the lampstands, I saw someone like a son of man, wearing a full-length robe with a golden sash over his chest. And his head and his hair were like white wool, white as glistening snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. And his feet were like bright metal as though they were glowing in a fire and his voice was like the roar of many rushing waters in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword and his face was like shining like the brightness of the blinding sun when I saw him I fell down at his feet as good as dead but he laid his right hand on me and I heard his reassuring voice saying don't yield to fear I am the beginning and I am the end, the living one. I was dead, but now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys that unlock death and the unseen world. Now I want you to write what you have seen, what is, and what will be after the things that I reveal to you. The mystery of the lampstands and the seven stars is this. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. And the seven stars in my right hand are the seven messengers of the seven churches. Chapter 2. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Ephesus. For these are the words of the one who holds the seven stars firmly in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know all that you've done for me. You have worked hard and persevered. I know that you don't tolerate evil, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles and proved that they are not, for they were impostors. I know how you have bravely endured trials, persecutions because of my name, yet you have not become discouraged. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place of influence if you do not repent. Although, to your credit, you despise the practices of the Nicolaitans, <laughs> which I also despise. The one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is saying now 
to all the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give access to feast on the fruit of the tree of life that is found in the paradise of God. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna. For those, for these are the words of the one who is the beginning and the end, the one who became a corpse but came back to life. I am aware of all the painful difficulties you have passed through and your financial hardships, even though in fact you possess rich treasure. And I am fully aware of the slander that has come against you from those who claim to be Jews but are really not. For they are the sat a satanic congregation. Do not yield to fear in the face of the suffering to come. But be aware of this. The devil is, a is about to have some of you thrown into prison to test your faith. For ten days you will have distress. But remain faithful to the day you die. And I will give you a victor's crown of life. To the... To one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is presently saying to all the churches. The one who conquers will not be harmed by the second death. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Pergamum. For these are the words of the one whose words pierce the hearts of men. I know where you live, where Satan sits enthroned, Yet you still cling faithfully to the power of my name. You do not deny your faith in me even in the days of my faithful martyr Antipas, who was executed in your city where Satan lives. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to eat things that were sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Furthermore, you have some who hold to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. So repent, or I will come quickly to war against them with the sword of my mouth. But the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is presently saying to all the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will let him feast on the hidden manna and give him a shining white stone. And write upon the white stone, and written upon the white stone is inscribed his new name, known only to the one who receives it. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Thyatira. For these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished brass. I know all that you've done for me, your love and faith your ministry and steadfast perseverance. In fact, you now excel in these virtues even more than at the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is seducing my loving servants. She is teaching that it is permissible to indulge in sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I have waited for her to repent from her vile immorality, but she refuses to do so. Now I will lay her low with terrible distress, along with all her adulterous partners, if they do not repent. And I will strike down her followers with a deadly plague. Then all the congregations will realize that I am the one who thoroughly searches the most secret thought, and the innermost being. I will give to each one that their works what their works deserve. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who don't adhere to the teachings of Jezebel and have not been initiated into deep satanic secrets, I say to you, without laying upon you any other burden, cling tightly to all you have until I appear. To everyone who is victorious and continues to do my works, to the very end, I will give you authority over the nations to shepherd them with a royal scepter and the rebellious will be shattered as clay pots even as I also received authority from the presence of my Father. I will give the morning star to the one who experiences victory so the one whose heart 
is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is presently saying to all the churches. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Sardis. For these are the words of the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know all that you do. I know that you have a reputation for being really alive, but you're actually dead. Wake up and strengthen all that remains before it dies. For I have found your works to be perfect. I, have, I haven't found your works to be perfect in the sight of my God. So remember all the things you've received and heard. Then turn back to God and obey them. For if you continue to slumber, I will come to you like a thief. And you'll have no idea what hour I come. Yet there are still a few in Sardis who have remained pure. And they will walk in fellowship with me in brilliant light. For they are worthy. And the one who experiences victory will be dressed in white robes. And I will never, no, never erase your name from the book of life. I will acknowledge your name before my Father and his angels. So the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Philadelphia. For these are the solemn words of the Holy One, the True One who has David's key, who opens doors that none can shut, and who closes doors that none can open. I know all that you've done. Now I have set before you a wide open door that none can shut. For I know that you possess only a little power, yet you have kept my word and haven't denied my name. Watch how I deal with those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews but are not, for they are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and acknowledge how much I've loved you. Because you've passionately kept my message of perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of proving that is coming to test every person on the earth. But I come swiftly, so cling tightly to what you have, so that no one may seize your crown of victory. For the one who is victorious I will make you to be a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, permanently secure. I will write on you the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, descending from my God out of heaven. And I'll write my own name on you. So the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is now saying to all the churches. Write the following to the messenger of the congregation of Laodicea. For these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know all that you do, and I know that you are neither frozen in apathy nor fervent with passion. How I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I am about to spit you from my mouth. For you claim I'm rich. And getting richer, I don't need a thing. Yet you are clueless, and you're miserable, poor, blind, barren, and naked. So I counsel you to purchase gold, perfected by fire, so that you can be truly rich. Purchase a white garment to cover you and clothe your shameful Adam nakedness. Purchase eye salve to be placed over your eyes, so that you can truly see. All those I dearly love, I unmask and train. So repent and be eager to pursue what is right. Behold, I am standing at the door knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice, and you open the door within, I will come into you and feast with you, and you will feast with me. And the one who conquers, I will give the privilege of sitting with me on my throne, just as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. To the one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is saying now to the churches. Chapter 4 Then suddenly, after I wrote these messages, wrote down these messages, I saw a heavenly portal open before me. In the same trumpet voice I heard speaking with me at the beginning, broke the silence and said, Ascend into this realm, I want to reveal to you what must happen after this. 
Instantly I was taken into the spirit realm, and behold, I saw a heavenly throne set in place, and someone seated upon it. His appearance was like sparkling like crystal, and glowing like a car carnelian gemstone. Surrounding the throne was a circle of green light like an emerald rainbow. Encircling the great throne were twenty-four thrones with elders in glistening white garments upon them, each wearing a golden crown of victory. And pulsing from the throne were blinding flashes of lightning, crashes of thunder and voices, and burning before the throne are seven blazing torches which represent the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne was a pavement like a crystal sea of glass. Around the throne on each side stood four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature resembled a lion, the second an ox, the third a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, full of eyes all around and under their wings. They worshipped without ceasing, day and night, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty! the was, the is, and the coming. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to the one who was enthroned and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell face down before the one seated on the throne and they worshipped the one who lives forever and ever. And they surrendered their crowns before the throne singing, You are worthy, O Lord God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your plan they were created and exist. Chapter 5 And I saw that the one seated on the throne was holding in his right hand an unopened scroll with writing on the inside and on the outside, and it was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw an incredibly powerful angel proclaiming with a great loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seven seals? But no person could be found, living or dead, in all of creation. No one was worthy to open the scroll and to read its contents. So I broke down weeping with an intense sorrow, because there was no one worthy to break open the scroll and read its contents. Then the one, then one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping! Look, the mighty lion of Judah's tribe, the root of David, he is conquered. He is the worthy one who can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a young lamb standing in the middle of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders, and he appeared to have been s slaughtered, but was now alive. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God sent out to the ends of the earth. I saw a young lamb approach the throne and receive the scroll from the hand, the right hand of the one who sat there. And when the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures saw the Lamb had taken the scroll. They fell face down at the feet of the Lamb and worshipped Him. Each of them had a harp of golden bowls brimming full of sweet fragrance incense, which are the prayers of God's holy lovers. And they were all singing this new song of praise to the Lamb. Because you were slaughtered for us, because you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, your blood was the price paid to redeem us. You purchased us to bring us to God out of every tribe, language, people group, and nation. You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voices of the myriads, myriads of angels encircling around the throne as well as the voices the living creatures and the elders myriads and myriads as I watched all of them they were singing with thunderous voices worthy is the Christ the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive great power and might wealth and wisdom and honor and glory and praise and every living being joined in an angelic choir 
every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth, in the sea, and everything in them. They were worshiping with one voice, saying, Praise, honor, glory, dominion be to the God enthroned, and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures responded, Amen. And the twenty-four elders threw themselves face down to the ground and worshipped. Breaking the scroll. <laughs> then I watched. Chapter 6. <laughs> then I watched as the Lamb break open the first of the seven seals. Immediately I heard one of the four living creatures call out with a powerful voice of revelation sounding like thunder saying, Come forth. So I looked, and behold, there was a bright horse. Its rider had a bow, and it was given a crown of victory. He rode out as a conqueror, ready to conquer. <laughs> ready to conquer. Then he broke open the second seal, and I heard the second living creature call out, Come forth! And there appeared another horse, red like fiery flames, and its rider was given a great sword, and the power to take peace from the earth, causing one to put to death another. I don't know, my, 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 after the anointing showed up, my iPad froze. Uh, I guess we'll have to call it, uh, man, it happens a lot when I read the word of God out loud. My iPad, I can't go past chapter six right now, so I guess I'll have to cut this video. Oh, I don't know what happened. Like it goes, it doesn't scroll past chapter six. <laughs> uh... Wow, I really wanted to read the entire book. I'll have to start another video and maybe start it over again. But uh, the reason I started crying is because there's something inside of my heart to worship God. Um, you know, let's just make a video on it. Um, one of the reasons why I like to worship God just by myself, or I love corporate worship. I love it when you know two or three are gathered in His name, or even two to three hundred, or two to three thousand. Doesn't matter. We're just basically gathered in the presence of God to worship Him. And uh, but when you worship God, like you could do it like 24/7, even just here in your own home. Like you can put on a you got YouTube, you can put on any worship song, and you can just go away with the Lord, put a song on repeat, and just the whole natural realm just kind of fades into the background, is practically irrelevant. And you just go off with the Lord, and there's no one to stop what you're doing to give announcements of man, there's no one with a schedule, there's no one with, like, you have to do this, you have to, it's all about... You are free. It is for freedom Christ has set you free. And you can just go be alone with the Lord in the secret place. The secret place of the Most High God is in your spirit realm. In your spirit man, when you're in that first love gate, with the Lord. Where all the distractions have been burnt. <laughs> they've been pushed back down to the earth. And you are seated with Him in heavenly places, heart to heart. Like John leaning his head upon the Beloved. Just... Feeling his heartbeat. And uh, I long for the day when all of humanity just gives God what we were created to give. <laughs> he poured unconditional love into us so that we can pour unconditional love back to Him. You know, my whole life, I realized that from day one, since I was born again, I've always saw myself as Mary. I always just wanted to sit at his feet. I always just want to hear his words. I always wanted to pour out my heart and just, you know, he washed my feet, so I just want to pour out my my tears onto his. Uh, she was a worshiper. She surrendered everything. She gave 
all the value that she like man who was that a, a year's wages just just waste getting wasted on Jesus wasting everything on Jesus and getting wasted on Jesus on the love of God and when I hear all those elders just angelic worship of the lab you know everyone's in heaven just word holy like man something goes off inside of me <sighs> my inner being just feels alive because that's what I was created to do I once asked God, I said, God, what's the purpose of life? And he told me, love. And when you're in true spirit and truth worship, you're in perfect love. Because God is love. God is, God is spirit. You know, the truth is always caked with the spirit of love. Even if it comes as a rebuke, there will be the spirit of love there. That you know this is God. It's God's spirit. And God is love. Even when God rebuked me in heaven for having conditional love towards someone on the earth, He rebuked me in love because there was unconditional love just pouring through my entire spirit, but He didn't even turn His face towards me. He was busy looking at the one that I wouldn't look towards, that I had like stuff in my heart towards. And I came out of that experience a changed person. I came out of that experience like knowing that like, God doesn't change, I'm the one who needs to change back into His image. And the only way you get changed in the image of God is going from glory to glory. That means not just reading about God, but experiencing the God that you're reading about as you read it. <laughs> you know, the Word of God is a door. Jesus said, I am the door. You know, John chapter 10, He's the Word of God. You go through Him and experience Heaven, you cannot, there's no other way to the Father but through Jesus the Son, the Christ. You go through His precious blood, you go through the love gate, and you, the kingdom of heaven is just like it starts opening up wider. You start seeing it more clear the more uh, purified your heart becomes by loving Him. I can still myself down and just like always look towards Him, but I find that my deepest encounters with God come when I'm worshiping like it's just it's not I'm not looking for visions or I'm not looking sometimes I do but most of the time I'm not looking for anything I'm just looking to surrender everything in my heart to God and then he sees that as I'm emptying myself he just refills me with revelation knowledge with spiritual understanding with love with peace you know, He just fills me with His counsel. You, as you empty out your stuff, you start receiving this God's goodie bag. <laughs> you know, so you just, you, I think someone in the Bible said, I die daily, or I must uh, decrease so He must increase. I think John the Baptist said that, and but Paul said, I die daily. That's you're just constantly crucified. By you have a chance, every single day is a choice. To respond in the flesh or respond in Christ's nature. To pursue God or to pursue your hobbies. Every, every day is an opportunity to pursue God or pursue your idols. Like it doesn't, like there's no condemnation. It's just like, if you choose what is the best, the better way, like you can still have, like you can pursue God, you receive the gifts of the Spirit, you receive all these things. But the greatest of all, the greatest way is the love root. Because that's the manifest presence of God. It's the first love gate. You know, without love, all your revealing of mysteries is just probably irritating. Because <laughs> it's not caked with love. There's no substance in there to bring someone into an encounter with God. So love is the most important thing. It's like it's not just like human love. That's not it. You shall the, the love of God that passes understanding, passes knowledge. It's it's having a an encounter with the tree of life Himself. It's having an encounter with God. It's like Moses encountering the burning bush and it's just like he's one day he's shepherding sheep the next day he's shepherding nation you know one day he's uh, he's running from Pharaoh 
the next day he's he's like standing in the authority of God confronting Pharaoh commanding him to release the, those he's taken captive you know the authority didn't come from Moses trying to stir something up to make his life better trying to help people his authority came from the encounter with the burning bush his encounter with God all authority is given from in him in your relationship with him the measure of your depth of your relationship with his God is the merit is the measure of the authority that you walk in constantly Jesus said all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth all authority so that means that you have all authority but the authority is only accessed through your relationship with him that's why in Matthew chapter 10 it's like it says and Jesus called his disciples unto him and gave them authority to cast out devils gave them power to cast out devils and to heal the sick but notice how first it says and Jesus called his disciples unto him you're not going to get the power and the authority to cast out devils and heal the sick until you first go to him it's like the it's like the wise virgins knew where to go to get oil in their lamps so they can see the foolish virgins the reason they were foolish is because they went to the wise to get second-hand oil. When they could have went to the very same source where the wise ones went. Jesus said, come by I saw from me. I think we read it earlier today. I don't remember the exact words. So that you can see. Put I saw upon your eyes so that you can see. We go to him. He's our armor. He's our understanding. You know, so many people, like, they just, they believe all these demonic doctrines because they believe it in their brain, and they haven't been taught to believe in the hearts. They've been taught to fight the things of the Spirit through religion. Um, but God put wisdom in Solomon's heart. You, you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth, and then you're saved. <laughs> You know, you go from glory to glory by surrendering your heart to God and you start seeing the heart of God. And that's what changes you. What changed me in that heavenly encounter when I saw that, I saw that my heart wasn't made perfect. I still had flaws. I still had conditional love. I still, I wasn't, Christ wasn't fully formed in me. And I'm still on this journey because I'm still here. You can still see me. I haven't been... You know, like Enoch, or, my, or like Jesus on the mountain, where, or you know, his his clothes transfigured into bright, you know, heavenly lights, or Moses' face like shining and just terrifying humans with the with his godly nature. <laughs> you know, so we still have a ways to go. But one of the best ways to get there is not pursuing just revelation knowledge. I, I love the mysteries. I love the kingdom. I love all that. It's just depth. How deep can you go with God? How deep can you go into His heart? How deep can you go and remain? And then and from that place, go from glory to glory. Is your walk shallow? Or is your walk in the depths of God? Are you walking with God on the earth in a very distant way? Or are you walking with God in His manifest peace, presence, full armor of God? Whenever a devil shows up, you just... You see it for what it is because you're walking in the light. Everything's exposed to the light. There's no shame in the light. Adam and Eve only had shame because they disobeyed the Word of God to please God. The serpent, which is basically the religious spirit, like they saw that the tree was good for fruit to make you wise. It's the false wisdom. It's like the false wisdom of memorizing the Bible so that you can debate people or memorizing scripture so you can win every argument. That's not it at all. That is not why you study the Word of God. You study the Word of God because it's a door that takes you into re encounters with the living God. You go through the door of the Word. It's a framework for your soul so that you can understand. You have a framework. You have an anchor. You have something to hang on to. You have a framework that you can build upon. But it's it's the Spirit of God, your relationship with God, that brings life to that frame. And you can be built upon that framework, which is Christ. You can't build on anything else but Christ. 
You take his word. Uh, yeah, you fight demons with it. You fight like anything that rises up against the knowledge of God in your imagination, your thought life. You just cast it down by speaking the word of God. Obviously, yeah. Jesus did his warfare. You know, in the in the wilderness, he spoke the word of God, which was written. 